Who is Latavius Murray, and what has he done with the Oakland Raiders offense? And with Josh Gordon back on the field, who should you be benching to get him in your starting lineup? I'll answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter, and I'll give you my busts and sleepers for Week 12 of the NFL season. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Everybody. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwid, and I am here twice a week, every week, to answer your questions and give you the advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. So, first thing I want to do today, guys, is start off by talking about Thursday night football. The Oakland Raiders got their first win of the season. It had been over an entire calendar year since these guys had gotten a win. So, congratulations to them. They were able to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Big, big win for them as far as, you know, morale goes. I mean, going 0-16 would be pretty detrimental for the entire franchise, I imagine. But it's nice to see them actually get a win. Sucks for Chiefs fans, though, because their team had been looking very, very good. A lot of people were talking about that they might potentially be able to dethrone the Broncos there in the AFC West. Doesn't look like that's probably going to happen at this point, though. If they're losing to teams like the Raiders, it's going to be pretty tough to beat the Broncos down the stretch here. But still, I think that, you know, we we need to consider that maybe Oakland isn't quite as bad as we thought they were. They're still a bad, bad team, don't get me wrong. But maybe there's something to be excited about. And the thing that I'm looking at as something to be excited about is running back Latavius Murray. This guy is somebody that we had talked a little bit about last week, or I guess, what was it, earlier this week on the show, before Thursday Night Football, I think. I had mentioned that Latavius Murray was somebody that I was looking at as somebody to potentially pick up in your deeper leagues. Obviously, I don't think he's somebody that you should have been picking up going into Thursday Night Football if you were in a 10 or even a 12-team league, but... When you're in your 14 team, your 16 team, your deeper leagues, ones that have a lot of bench spots and things like that, you got to go out there and you got to pick up these guys who have decent games and who, you know, really look like they have the potential to pick up maybe a starting role in their offense. And that might be what Latavius Murray did on Thursday Night Football scored two touchdowns. He also had the longest play from scrimmage in the NFL this season, a 90 yard touchdown run. The guy looks like he has everything that you would want in a running back. I I mentioned him in my preseason analysis as being a guy who could potentially be a sleeper in your fantasy leagues this year. I, obviously, it hasn't worked out until this point, but you know the, the thought process for me at the time was Darren McFadden is an injury-prone guy who's never played an entire season that I can remember. Uh, Maurice Jones-Drew, uh, also a guy who's been injured as of late in the past couple of seasons, and both of these guys are getting old. They're both not what they were in their prime. And realistically, I don't know what Oakland was thinking signing both of them and and having both of them on the roster. But, you know, you look at it and you look at a guy like Latavius Murray, who is a young guy who suffered an injury, but who has that physical build to be a potential franchise running back. And that's what I saw in Latavius Murray in the preseason. That's what I've, uh, you know, everything that we've heard about this guy is that he has just put up ridiculous things in practice. Uh, I mean, he's gone out there and done what it takes to advance himself, not only as a runner, but also as a receiver and even as a blocker. And that's really what you want in a franchise running back. So if Oakland is looking for somebody down the, the road here and they're, they're looking to improve not just on what they're doing this year, but for the next three, four, five seasons, this could be the guy that they look for as their running back. And that's, I think, the important thing to look at here. I don't necessarily think that Latavius Murray is going to be a guy that you can trust on a week-to-week basis in your standard leagues, but at this point, you know, given the fact that there's just not a lot on the waiver wire 12 weeks into the season... I think Latavius Murray is somebody that you've got to go out there and get now in your 10 or your 12 team leagues after what we saw him do here on Thursday Night Football. Again, Oakland's coaching staff has not committed to him being the starter, so we could still see a lot of Darren McFadden. I think Maurice Jones-Drew at this point is pretty much uh, useless, but if... 
Maurice Jones-Drew is off, and Darren McFadden is an injured guy who, you know, a guy who potentially could get injured down the stretch here, and also just who hasn't performed. I mean, Darren McFadden's been mediocre at the very best. I don't even think you could classify what he's done as mediocre. It's pretty much bad at this point. So there's not a whole lot to gain by keeping Darren McFadden on the field. Other than that, you just think that he, you know, maybe knows the offense better. Or I, I don't even, I have no idea. Maybe he puts more butts in the seats because he's Darren McFadden and people like Darren McFadden for whatever reason. I have no idea. But the fact of the matter is that if the Oakland Raiders want to find somebody to be their running back for a couple years here, I don't think they can look at Darren McFadden or Maurice jones Drew. I think it has to be Latavius Murray. And that's why in your dynasty leagues, I'm looking at this guy as being a very hot pickup this week. Uh, I would say he's probably the number one, maybe number two guy behind Jonas Gray if he's still available. Um and I, I would hope Jonas Gray isn't available in your league at this point, in your dynasty league. But you look at a guy like Latavius Murray, and like I mentioned, he has all the things that you look for as being a potential fantasy football star running back. The only problem is that he's in Oakland. <laughs> and I know that's not something that we can easily overlook. We have to consider the fact that this guy hasn't done anything really of, of any value from a fantasy standpoint other than this one game. But... When we're looking at this deep in the season and we're trying to find guys who could potentially be stars for next year or even just starters for next year, Latavius Murray is about as good as it's going to get. So make sure that you go out here and snag him in your dynasty leagues and just take a chance on him. Even if he doesn't end up being the starter for the rest of the year or for next season, you know, at least you took a shot on him. And I don't think you're wasting a whole lot on him at this point, even if you give up your number one waiver wire claim on him. Who else is going to break out at this point? I mean, we've got, what, five weeks left in the season, roughly? It's just, it's very unlikely that you're going to get much better in terms of waiver wire acquisitions than Latavius Murray. So I would go out here and get him as quickly as possible. Another guy who is going to be a potential guy that people are picking up for this weekend's games, and that is Josh Gordon at Atlanta. Josh Gordon had a huge game in his first contest back from a suspension last year. And it, and albeit it only was a two-game suspension, I understand that, but he caught 10 passes for 146 yards and a touchdown in his first game back last year. So you have to look at Josh Gordon as being an exciting player. He was the number one overall fantasy uh, wide receiver for most leagues last year, had just a ridiculous season overall, and... The guy has the physical ability to be the number one wide receiver from this point through the rest of the season. The question is, is does he have any chemistry at all with the quarterback situation there with Brian Hoyer? And, uh, I mean, are they good enough on offense that they're going to be able to make use of his talents? Well, we're going to see this weekend. And... I think from a fantasy standpoint, we look at Josh Gordon as being a guy who, like I said, has the wide receiver one upside. But for right now, I think that you have to look at him as a wide receiver two. I have him ranked somewhere between 12th to 14th at wide receiver. A couple of guys that I have ranked above him for this weekend, Mike Evans. Alshon Jeffrey, T.Y. Hilton. I have Emmanuel Sanders if he plays. We still don't know for 100% certain that Emmanuel Sanders is going to play, but it does sound like there's a good chance that he will suit up here on Sunday. So uh, all those guys I've got ranked above him going into this weekend's games, but for guys that I'm ranking below him, guys who I would definitely bench for Jeff, uh, J Josh Gordon. I almost called him Jeff Gordon. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to think I'm a big NASCAR fan. I don't think I've watched a NASCAR race in like... I don't know, 15 years, and then, what was I, like 10 back then, 12, so, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not a NASCAR guy, Josh Gordon, <laughs> I would play above these guys, Sammy Watkins, Golden Tate, Deshaun Jackson, Roddy White, I have all those guys listed as guys that I would bench for Josh Gordon, so hopefully that helps you out with just kind of determining where I value Josh Gordon this week, given the fact that we haven't seen him play at all. I'm not sure that he's necessarily a must start, but I think as a flex or a wide receiver three, he absolutely is. You have to take a chance on the upside. There just aren't going to be many guys that have a higher potential upside than Josh Gordon this week or, or really any week. Atlanta's awful, and their defense is one of the worst in the, in the league. So if there's going to be a, a favorable matchup for him to come back to, 
it's going to be this. I, obviously, he's on the road in Atlanta, but I don't think that's going to matter. I don't think Josh Gordon's going to be tired from travel. I mean, the guy is completely healthy at this point. That's something to consider as well. He hasn't had 11 games on his body or 10 games on his body like his teammates have. So he's going to be the healthiest guy on the roster. Well, uh, you would presume so anyway, as long as he showed up to camp in shape, and it sounds like he did. So, or I shouldn't say to camp, to practice. I mean, obviously, we're way past training camp at this point. But the the reports from the Cleveland Browns practice are that he is getting just chucked the ball by Brian Hoyer, like every play practically. He's just out there finding ways to sling the rock to Josh Gordon. So that's fun from a fantasy standpoint. We'd love to hear those type of reports. But, you know, at this point, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. So I don't think I would be, you know, benching your stud receivers for him. I'll tell you this. I, I have a league where we only start two wide receivers. It's a very old league, like a league that's been around for, I don't know, 12 years at this point or something. And we only start two wide receivers and two running backs. We don't have a flex position. So the rosters are pretty stacked. You know, you've got a lot of good guys that you put on your bench. And I'll tell you this. I have Randall Cobb and Des Bryant. And I'm not starting Josh Gordon over those guys. So Josh Gordon is going to be on my bench in a league. And I feel kind of bad about myself about that because I really want to have him out there. But I just don't think you can bench your guys who have been producing, like your Dez and your Randall Cobbs. So, you know, help, hopefully that's a little bit helpful for you guys. I do want everybody to get him into your lineup, like I mentioned, as a flex or as a wide receiver three, particularly in PPR formats. But... This guy should be able to be a quality wide receiver two for you down the stretch here. I don't view him as being a wide receiver one yet until we see him actually on the field. So please be sure to make the right decision on Josh Gordon this weekend. Don't bench your studs, but get him in there if you're, you know, sitting there with like a, you know, like I said, a Roddy White or, you know, somebody like that who maybe doesn't have quite the high end potential of, of, your, uh, of your Josh Gordon. Just make sure you're out there making the decision that's going to get you the most points uh, potential-wise this weekend. So let's move on and talk about some fan questions because I know you guys always have those coming into Sunday's games, and I want to make sure that I answer as many of those as I can for you today. So if you're interested in answer, or asking any questions, excuse me, uh, be sure to tweet them to me at ClickwithTV, or of course you can leave them in the comment section below. I'll be dropping this video on Sunday morning, so be sure to, you know, if you're asking any questions, get them to me as soon as possible and don't wait until five minutes before the game because I'm probably not going to be able to answer it. Um, and also, guys, just, just to give you a heads up, I might be at the hospital this morning. One of my best friends is in the hospital. Pretty serious situation. So um, we're not going to, you know, talk a lot about that here. I might, I might mention that in another video that I make. I'm not for certain how I'm going to feel about it, but we'll see how I'm feeling about that. Um, but you know, if I don't respond to your questions this week in the comments or the tweets in, uh, in terms of like the hours leading up to the game after this video drops, please understand it's not anything personal. I'm not trying to not respond to you. It's just, you know, life comes first sometimes. So, all right, let's get into the questions though. The first one comes from beast hunter 2347, and he has a trade question in a standard scoring league. He asks, should I trade Arian Foster and Julius Thomas away for Rob Kronkowski? All right. <clears throat> first of all, I want to say that for the remainder of the season, Rob Gronkowski is my number one fantasy tight end. This guy is an absolute rock star, and I've said it before. If there is not any sort of concern about injury, Rob Gronkowski is a top five fantasy football draft pick. I'm I'm dead serious about that. This guy is better than Jimmy Graham, and I I that's not to say that I don't like Jimmy Graham, and he's better than Julius Thomas as well. And again, that's not to say I don't like Julius Thomas. Those guys are both amazing tight ends. I would love to have them as my tight end one in every single league. I don't because I'm not a good drafter. No, I'm just joking. But uh, I don't have all of those guys. But what I will say is that Rob Gronkowski has the kind of pace in terms of touchdowns that I don't think any other player in the history of the league is at. This guy is scoring almost a touchdown per game over the entire course of his career. So for the games that he's actually been on the field, he's scoring nearly a touchdown a game. That's freaking insane. That's like better than Jerry Rice numbers. That's better than anybody that I can ever think of in terms of skill position players. Now, obviously, quarterbacks are a different breed, but you know, you look at your running backs, your wide receivers, your tight ends. 
I can't think of anybody that has that kind of a pace. Uh, I mean, you might be able to make a case for a young guy like a, you know, like a Kelvin Benjamin or something who's only played 10 games and, you know, he has, what, eight or nine touchdowns so far this year. But other than those guys who are, have played such a limited sample size, I mean, this guy is just blowing it up. I mean, for the course of his career, he's uh, he's putting up insane numbers. The wide receiver won numbers out of a tight end. I love Rob, Rob Gronkowski, but I would say no to this trade. Arian Foster, I understand he's not going to play on Sunday. Alfred Blue, it sounds like, is going to be your starter here for the Houston Texans this weekend. And Julius Thomas is suffering from an injury as well. But what I will tell you is that both of these guys are expected to be back in the next couple of weeks here. I wouldn't be surprised at all if both of them play next week. So if you need to make this trade Sunday morning, if you you know if you're listening to this podcast and you can still make this trade before this weekend's games, you know. I would think that I would be more likely to make that trade just because both of these guys are going to be limited if they do play. Arian Foster is almost not, it's almost certain that he's not going to play. Julius Thomas, I think, is going to be limited this week. So I could understand if you absolutely need a win this week that you make this trade. But if you can't make the trade before these games start this week, and, you know, given the fact that Julius Thomas is going to be back and probably near 100% next week, and Arian Foster should be at least healthy enough to start next week. I don't think that the value of those two guys for Rob Gronkowski is fair. I think that I would certainly rather have Foster and Thomas, just because Julius Thomas, like I mentioned, is either the tight end number two or number three for the remainder of the year. This guy's been a rock star for the past two seasons. He's put up ridiculous numbers when he's been out there. So there's nothing to dislike about him. Yeah, he might be lower than Gronkowski on my list, but would I be that surprised if Julius Thomas just flat out outscores Gronkowski for the rest of the year? No, I really wouldn't. Julius Thomas is that good. I think that he could put up big, big numbers for the rest of the year. And of course, Arian Foster has been an amazing running back this year as well. It's always been the injuries with him, at least lately. So, you know, as long as he's on the field, I'm not worried about him putting up good numbers. So yeah, I would not do this trade if I'm you. Uh, unless you absolutely need the the points this week. And if you do and you can make the trade, then I think it's a little bit more palatable, but I would still probably err toward not doing it. All right, next question comes from Jason Kirk on YouTube, and he asks, should I give up Alfred Morris and Rashad Jennings for Andre Ellington in a PPR league? Now, he's going to be giving up two running backs for one running back. So we have to know what his other running backs are. And thankfully, he let us know. He said his other running backs are Joyke Bell and Fred Jackson. So at the moment, he has Alfred Morris, Rashad Jennings, Joyke Bell, and Fred Jackson. He wants to give up Morris and Jennings for Ellington in the PPR format. Now, what I will say is that Ellington is a guy who is certainly more valuable in PPR formats because the Arizona Cardinals have already mentioned that they're going to try and get him the ball more, and he's already on pace to be one of the highest uh, t- touching the ball running backs this season. So I think that I would probably say, ah, gosh, this is a tough one. It really is because, okay, here's the deal. You're getting an upgrade. I don't think there's any question about that. I would rather have Ellington than either Jennings or Morris for this format. But the problem is is that if you get Ellington, you have to start Joyke Bell or Fred Jackson every game from here on out. And that's not very good. Uh, We haven't seen either of those guys be consistent whatsoever this season. Both guys have suffered from numerous injuries. And neither guy has put up big numbers even when they've been healthy. So given the fact that I think you're too thin at the other running back positions... I would probably not do this trade just because I think that you probably need to start Alfred Morris and Rashad Jennings every week right now. And uh, if you give them up, you're going to be starting Ellington, who's a slight upgrade from probably from Jennings or Morris. But at the same time, though, you have to start either Bell or Jackson every week. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Ellington probably has the toughest schedule of any running back going down the stretch. Or maybe Marshawn Lynch might be harder, but one of those two guys has the toughest schedule for running backs going down the stretch. So although both of them are going to get plenty of carries, it's going to be tough for them to produce big, big numbers down the stretch here because they just are playing such tough defenses. And and the defenses that they play do not concede a lot of rushing yardage or a lot of rushing touchdowns. So kind of sucks that you have to sit here with Alfred Morris, who is pretty much one of the worst running backs as far as, you know, their value dropping in PPR formats. But 
At the same time, though, I still think he's a quality running back, too. So I would stick with Morris and Jennings. Just hope that Jennings gets back and, and is fully healthy. I mean, obviously, he played last week, but... I don't think he was fully healthy. We need to see him, you know, get out there and get his full complement of carries and just start producing like he was at the beginning of the year. Because if he does that, I wouldn't be surprised to see Jennings be very close to Andre Ellington in terms of points for the remainder of the year. And then Alfred Morris, I don't think there's any question that he's probably going to outscore Joyke Bell or Fred Jackson down the stretch. So uh, I think it's a net loss if you do make this trade. Next question comes from David Crowley on YouTube, and he asks, who should I start at quarterback this weekend? He has Philip Rivers at St. Louis, Mark Sanchez, who is at, or excuse me, Philip Rivers at home versus St. Louis, Mark Sanchez at home versus Tennessee, and then Mike Vick, who is against the Buffalo Bills. That game will be played on Monday night in Detroit, so it's kind of a neutral field game, but all right, here's the thing. Mike Vick, too inconsistent at this point. Uh, we haven't seen him put up the big game yet, so I'm going to scratch him out as being somebody that I would even consider. This is a tough game against the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, again, it's at a neutral field, so we like that a little bit better, but even if it was in New York, I still wouldn't like Mike Vick over these two guys. Phillip Rivers has been very, very... Uh, He's been weak lately, let's just put it that way. Uh, his fantasy points have certainly dropped off over the past couple of weeks, but I still think that I would start him over a Mark Sanchez. I understand that the Eagles offense is capable of putting up big points. Jordan Matthews has really come out and looked good over the past couple of weeks, and of course Jeremy Macklin has been good all year, but it's Mark Sanchez, guys. Like, Would you really be surprised if he did what he did last week, which is a pretty mediocre game, or would you be surprised if he goes out there against the Titans, who are by all explanations, an average defense at best, would you be surprised if he went out there and threw for 160 yards, a touchdown, and a pick? I wouldn't. I mean, I think that's a fairly realistic stat line, to be completely honest with you. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happened and they win the game, you know, 14 to 10 or whatever. It's just, it's not a good situation there um, with Mark Sanchez, in my opinion, because the guy just doesn't have the physical skills, I think, at this point, or whether it be the physical skills or just the confidence to put up big numbers from a fantasy standpoint. So I don't like that. I think Philip Rivers is, Philip Rivers, excuse me, is your guy who has the highest potential this week against the Rams. I know the Rams looked very, very good this past week against the Broncos, but still, I don't think you disregard the fact that Philip Rivers is the best quarterback of this group. And another thing to consider is that this game is in San Diego versus being in St. Louis. So the last game that the Broncos played against the Rams was in St. Louis. And I think there's a big difference between St. Louis playing at home versus on the road. We've seen a big gap between what they do on the road versus what they do at home. And I would expect to see Phillip Rivers put up a couple of touchdowns this week, which should be good enough to make him the top scoring quarterback of this grouping. Next question comes from Toad Sniper on YouTube, and he asks us to pick three of this group. He has probably the best wide receiver group that I have heard. Here we go. Randall Cobb at Minnesota, Des Bryant at New York Giants, Calvin Johnson at the New England Patriots, and Josh Gordon at the Atlanta Falcons. So all three or all four of these guys are ranked within my top, you know, like I mentioned, 12 to 14 or so. Very excellent group of wide receivers here. I understand you only have to pick three of them. The first thing that I want to tell you to do, though, all three of these guys should be unquestioned starters for your team for the rest of the season. Whichever three guys you decide to go with here, you stick them in your lineup every single week, assuming that they get or that they're healthy. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to trade away one of these guys, and I'm probably going to trade away the guy who I think has the highest value at this point in time. And it depends on your league, but I'm going to guess that that's either Calvin Johnson or Des Bryant. Now, Randall Cobb, I think, has been the highest scorer of this group, but I think that most people still value Des Bryant and Calvin Johnson, just given the fact that they've been more consistent over the past couple of seasons with putting up big points. But again, you have to really look at what your league is kind of made up of. If, if you're in the Texas area or if you're in the, uh, the Detroit area or if you're in the Green Bay, if you're in mid the Midwest— and you can trade away one of these guys to somebody who is a little bit of a fan of them, you might be able to get a little bit better value. I'm going to stick with Josh Gordon, though, just because, 
Well, I mean, obviously, if you can get a good value for Josh Gordon, given the fact that we don't know what he's worth at this point particularly, I would do that. But I, I'm assuming you're not going to get fair market value for Josh Gordon until we at least see what he can do on the field. And then you have to reanalyze the situation from there. But the point that I'm trying to make here is you have to trade away one of these guys. And it really depends on your league's makeup who that trade is. But you have to trade one of them away to get an upgrade at another position. You just have to. You can't sit and bench one of these stud guys, one of these top 15 wide receivers every week. It's too valuable for you to have them on your roster or or to have an upgrade on your roster over having them on your bench. So please be sure to pick who you want to start this week and try and trade the other guy. Just do your best, do your absolute best to get the most that you can and get an upgrade. Now, to answer your actual question here, what I'm going to say is that I'm going to bench Josh Gordon because I don't know what he's going to do this weekend. Calvin Johnson against New England, um, it's not the best matchup because Darrell Revis is probably going to be on him most of the day, but I still think it's Calvin Johnson and you don't bench Calvin Johnson in any matchup. So I'm going to go with him. Des Bryant at the Giants. Des is just an absolute beast. Guy's been putting up ridiculous numbers. And, of course, Randall Cobb at Minnesota. I mean, I can't really think of many wide receivers that I would start over Randall Cobb this week. He's my number one of this group. Des is number two. Calvin Johnson, number three. And Josh Gordon, number four. So hopefully that helps you out. Be sure to make that trade, though. All right. Next question comes from Alistar Marsden. Excuse me if I mispronounce that. Seven on YouTube. Now, he asks... I need to pick two of this group. I have Jonas Gray, Vincent Jackson at Chicago, and Denard Robinson at Indianapolis. Jonas Gray, of course, against the Detroit Lions at home. So this is a flex question, and he doesn't mention if it's a PPR league or not. I think a PPR league would help Vincent Jackson a little bit. But what I'm going to say is that I'm going to go with Jonas Gray given the fact, or excuse me, I'm going to bench Jonas Gray, given the fact that he is up against the Detroit Lions. And I know what you guys are thinking. Jonas Gray just got came off of a four touchdown, 200 yard game. But here's the deal. Jonas Gray was a a guy who really hadn't done much until this past week. Um, He came off of the practice squad. I don't think the physical skills that Jonas Gray possesses are anything spectacular. But he is going to be likely the starting running back this weekend. Um, the one concern that I have here is that he missed practice one day this week. Now, I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday, but I want to say it was one of those two days. He w- Well, excuse me. He, wasn't, he didn't miss practice. He was late to practice, and then he was sent home because he was late for practice. So he missed an entire day where this team was building a game plan to go up against Detroit, who is one of the absolute best defenses in the league this year. So I don't like the fact that he was not out there practicing with his team for what should be one of the biggest games that they play this year. And given the fact that they went out there and they picked up a running back named LeGarrette Blunt, who has performed well for them in the past, and they still have Shane Vereen on the roster... I'm not for certain that Jonas Gray is going to get all the carries. Now, it's very possible that nothing comes of this and Jonas Gray goes out there and gets 20 carries. But even if he gets 20 carries, if he gets into the end zone, great. But I don't necessarily think that 20 carries is going to translate even to 100 yards against the Lions. These guys have been that good. The Lions have probably the best front four in the league. So... I'm going to bench Jonas Gray. I think Vincent Jackson with Josh McCown at quarterback does look a little bit better. Denard Robinson has been excellent lately. And I understand he's against Indianapolis, who have been a team that is going to, they they typically put up a lot of points, which means that Denard Robinson could end up not touching the ball as much as a running back. But still, I, I like the situation enough. I think that he's going to get a consistent enough carries. I don't really think anybody is going to battle him for carries out of the Jacksonville backfield at this point. And with Vincent Jackson, like I mentioned, the the high-end potential of Vincent Jackson this week I think is pretty good against Chicago. This could be his biggest game of the year. So I'm going to go with Vincent Jackson and Denard Robinson, and I'm going to bench Jonas Gray. Next question comes from Miles Kalish on YouTube, and he asks another question about a New England running back. Here we go. Shane Vereen or Bishop Sankey this week in standard scoring? Now, Bishop Sankey really hasn't done a whole lot this year, but neither has Shane Vereen. Shane Vereen has been mediocre, very mediocre, and I mentioned that I don't know what the New England running back situation is going to be, but what I will tell you is that I would be extremely surprised if Shane Vereen ends up getting 20 carries this week, and against that Detroit defense, I just don't think he can sustain getting 
six, seven touches like he has and produce decent numbers, especially in a standard scoring non-PPR league. If this was PPR, I think it's a little bit closer. But with given the fact that we don't know how many carries Shane Vereen's going to get, and it's probably going to be under 10, I think Bishop Sankey's more likely to get more carries. Philadelphia's defense isn't very good, so I like the potential of Bishop Sankey better. I think he's a more likely to get you, you know, 6 to 10 points. And given the fact that Shane Vereen hasn't really done much more than that in any game this year, I think that that's probably where I would go. I'm going to go with Bishop Sankey in that. And then you had another question. You asked Vincent Jackson at Chicago or Mohamed Sanu at Houston in that same league. I am going to go again with Vincent Jackson, just given the fact that Chicago's defense has been so bad. I do like Mohamed Sanu this week as well, but... I think Vincent Jackson, this is potentially the week that he breaks out and reminds us that he is still a quality wide receiver. Next question comes from Michael Aruda on YouTube, and he asks to pick one of this group. So he has Frank Gore versus the Redskins, Ben Tate, who is now a member of the Minnesota Vikings, against the Green Bay Packers, Alfred Blue against the Cincinnati Bengals, and LeGarrette Blunt, who is now on the Patriots, and he is up against the Detroit Lions. So three straight questions. We've had three questions, or we've had uh, three people asking about three different New England Patriots running backs, and I think that should tell you something. We don't know what's going on here with New England. Um, it's very unpredictable, especially given the fact that that uh, Jonas Gray missed practice earlier this week. But what I will say is LeGarrette Blunt's not on the radar here. I think he's fourth of this group. We just don't know that he's going to get any carries. And Ben Tate, I think, is third on the group because, again, we don't know if he's going to get any carries. He hasn't had much time to work with the Vikings. And honestly, Jarek McKinnon has looked okay. Matt Asiata has been good in short yarded situations, and Jarek McKinnon has been good enough that he should be, you know, at least getting a decent number of touches. I don't think there's any question that Jarek McKinnon has more explosion to his game than Ben Tate does. So where does Ben Tate really fit in with the Vikings? I was kind of surprised that they went out there and picked him up. I just don't think he is anything I would be excited about. So I'm going to not go with Ben Tate. And then it basically comes down to Frank Gore versus the Redskins or Alfred Blue versus the Bengals. And I am going to go with Alfred Blue. Arian Foster is out this week. Uh, it's pretty much guaranteed at this point. I don't think it's been officially announced. But Alfred Blue is almost guaranteed to be the starter. If he is the starter, presuming that, he is going to be my running back. Cincinnati has not been good against opposing running backs. We'll talk about this a little bit more later in the show. But Alfred Blue is definitely going to be my guy. And I really like him this week. Next question comes from 37 Will Dog on YouTube, and he has a question about a flex position. Uh, I don't know if this is standard scoring or PPR, so I'm going to go with standard scoring. Just off of a default, we kind of have to do that. So, Reggie Wayne versus the Jaguars, Steven Jackson versus the Browns, or Alfred Blue versus the Bengals. And again, I'm going to go with Alfred Blue. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Alfred Blue has very nice, uh, he had a very nice game last week, and he has a nice matchup this week. So, we definitely like to see that. I would probably rank them Reggie Wayne second and Steven Jackson third, if that helps you out. All three of these guys are worth starting in your standard scoring leagues, but I do think that I would like Alfred Blue the most of the group. Next question comes from Beast Gone Gamer on YouTube, and he asks, who should I start of this group? He has Josh Gordon, Mike Evans, or Alshon Jeffrey, and I talked a little bit about this earlier. I think that you have to really consider where you're ranking Josh Gordon, given the fact that we don't really know how many you know snaps he's going to get, we don't know how many targets he's going to get, and we don't know what the whole you know, make up the chemistry that he might have with this offense is at this point. I'm going to bench Josh Gordon this week of this group because I like Mike Evans better at Chicago. Mike Evans has been just destroying people lately, and I would probably rank Alshon Jeffrey second of the group if that helps you out. He is against the Buccaneers. And uh, Alshon has not been super consistent this year, but he's put up good enough games that I still think that I would probably play him against the Buccaneers in your standard leagues. But again, I am going Mike Evans, number one here, Alshon Jeffrey, number two, and Josh Gordon, number three. But again, I still like all three of these guys. All of them are ranked in my top 15 at wide receiver. You're picking from a very nice group of receivers here. 
Next question comes from Joey2213X, and he asks, I picked up the Green Bay defense. Should I drop the Seattle defense at this point? All right, first of all, I almost never ask def or answer defensive questions, and the reason for it is because defenses are just extremely inconsistent. Even if you have the best defenses, what they really rely on is sacks, turnovers, and touchdowns. Very rarely are you going to get enough uh, defense that you're going to get significant points from just stopping the opposing offense from putting up points, if that makes sense. Um, it, it Of course, it depends on your scoring system as well. Uh, there are a lot of leagues out there that have very odd scoring for defenses. I was in a league where uh, a couple years ago where defenses put up a ton of points, and the reason for it is because the person that set up the league, they had put it up where yardage totals were were calculated into the amount of points that you got in addition to your sacks, your interceptions, your fumble recoveries, your touchdowns, if those came across, and also in addition to points allowed. So, I mean, there were weeks where defenses were putting up 20, 30 points, and that made things pretty interesting. You really actually had to examine defenses in that league and really try to determine, you know, if they're up against a bad offense, I'm probably going to go out there and pick them up on the waiver wire because, you know, you just could get so, so many big points out of those defenses. So it's really hard to predict what you should do in your standard scoring leagues with defenses because you just it, – it's – it's really hard to say this team is going to get a ton of sacks this week, even if it looks like a favorable matchup. So what? They get three to four sacks. Like, that's great and everything, but is it enough to really say that you should start them? I don't know. I mean, I would probably say, given the fact that Green Bay's defense has been "quote unquote" hot lately, I would probably start them over the Seahawks. But this even this whole question that you're as asking here really illustrates my point. When I go into every NFL season and I try to just articulate this in as many ways as I possibly can, I always say that you should wait to draft defenses. And the reason for it is because even the best defenses fall off very quickly in the NFL. It's happened time and time again. It's extremely rare that a defense is good over the course of a three to four or five season span. And even from one season to the next, you can go from being the number one defense to 15th. And it's not really anything surprising. So that's why I always say, like, when I see people drafting the Seahawks defense in the sixth round of drafts, I can't help but laugh. Because even, first of all, even if they put up the same points that they did last year, they're still not giving you a significant upgrade from other defenses on a week-to-week -week basis. They're, what, one to two points? Big deal. You can get a way bigger gap at running back, wide receiver, quarterback, tight end. So, I mean, I, I just, I, I scratch my head and shake my head at the people who draft these defenses so early. And that's why I would say... Yeah, I mean, I'm totally comfortable with dropping Seattle's defense. I, I don't really have, if if I somehow ended up with them on my team, I have no real reason to keep them around. It's not like I'm looking forward to at the end of their schedule and they've got, you know, these garbage teams that they're playing. No, they, they have decent teams that they're playing. They play San Francisco. They play Arizona down the stretch. I mean... Uh, it's it's not an easy schedule from here on out here for the Seattle Seahawks and their defense. So I just I don't love what you're looking at here with your defenses. Um, I, I don't love when people have multiple defenses on their roster. I, I just think that it's pointless. You don't sit and pick up multiple defenses on your team. If, if for whatever reason you don't like the defense that you currently have, drop them and pick up another one. You don't need to have multiple defenses on your roster, especially at this point in the season. All right, next question comes from Glorious Sports on on uh, Twitter, at Glorious Sports, and he asks, Bishop Sankey at Philadelphia, Shane Vereen versus Detroit, or Doug, ba or excuse me, Doug Baldwin, um, or Cecil Shorts at Indianapolis for his flex. So here's the thing. This is a, a classic example, I think, of you don't really have a whole lot to, to be excited about here. I don't really think any of these guys has a huge high-end potential this week. Um, Cecil Shorts has been okay at best. Shane Vereen hasn't done really anything of significance. And again, we don't know if this is a PPR or a standard scoring league. He did not mention that. Bishop Sankey, I had mentioned, I think is likely to touch the ball between 10 to 15 times this week. So I like that. And then Doug Baldwin has been easily Seattle's best receiver. The problem is that Seattle's passing game has been so mediocre and they're up against a pretty good Arizona defense. So all of these guys aren't spectacular. But the guy that I'm going to go with is Doug Baldwin 
because I just think that he has the highest potential at this point. I don't really think we've seen enough out of Bishop Sankey in terms of big games that I would be excited about him. Shane Vereen just against Detroit, I'm not, uh, there's just nothing to be excited about there. Cecil Shorts at Indianapolis, I could see starting, but again, I mean, is Jacksonville's offense going to put up 25 or more points this week? Probably not. So what's the real high-end potential of a Cecil Shorts? Uh, maybe, a, maybe a touchdown and 80 yards? I think that's like his pretty much his ceiling this week. So I, I'm going to go with Doug Baldwin. I just think that he's getting targeted a lot. I understand people have been saying Richard Sherman's going to play wide receiver this week for the Seahawks. Yeah, they'll probably have a couple plays set up where Richard Sherman lines up at wide receiver in some stupid, you know, gimmicky play. But it's not like Richard Sherman's going to go out there and start every play at wide receiver. I mean, Sherman is a guy who played wide receiver in college, so he could. But given the fact that they need him to play defense, they need him to be healthy, and they need him to be, you know, have enough energy on defense, I don't think that's going to be anything substantial. And I still think Doug Baldwin is going to be easily their wide receiver one. So I am going to go with Doug Baldwin. Next question comes from at Yun X Jets X E N T. So I apologize if I messed the pronunciation of that up, but. You got a crazy name there, buddy, and that is uh, a Twitter user, and he asks, should I trade away Josh Gordon and Golden Tate for T.Y. Hilton? I'm going to say no on this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Josh Gordon outscores T.Y. Hilton from here on out. I don't have him ranked above T.Y. Hilton, and, and actually I have him ranked pretty similarly to Golden Tate, but here's the thing. Josh Gordon has that potential to be the number one wide receiver from here on out. So I'm going to take my chances, given the fact that I, I have another reliable guy with Golden Tate if I don't have anything in Josh Gordon. if So if Josh Gordon completely busts out, he does terrible, or he gets hurt this week, or you know he gets busted with some more weed this week or something, yeah, you probably didn't make the right decision in this trade. But at the same time, though, Golden Tate's still been a quality wide receiver this year, and I think I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with balancing the risk and potential reward here. I love T.Y. Hilton. He's in my top 10 for the remainder of the year at wide receiver, but I just don't think it's worth, you know, an upgrade of, you know, four or five spots from Josh Gordon to T.Y. Hilton and having to give up a, a Golden Tate for that. So what we need to do here is look and see what Josh Gordon does this week. If he puts up a big game, I think you go back to this guy and see if you can get anything else in addition to T.Y. Hilton. And if you can, great. If you can't, then maybe you sit, sit pat with your Josh Gordon and uh, you, and you stay excited about the fact that he has you know the potential to be the top scoring wide receiver, like I had mentioned. All right. So that is going to do it for the questions, guys. If you Again, if you have any questions, please be sure to message them to me here on Twitter at ClickwoodTV, or you can leave them in the comment section below on YouTube. And I will do my best, like I said, to get to those as soon as I can. So now we're going to go through my bust and sleepers of the week. I've got a couple of them at a, a few of these different positions here. And if you guys are new to, the, to this show, what I typically do on a week-to-week -week basis is I go in and I look at the guys who I think have particularly good matchups or particularly bad matchups. And these guys, if, if they show up on the bust list, they're guys who are typically going to be in your starting lineup, but, but I'm going to recommend that you don't start them this week. And then guys, uh, your sleepers are guys who are usually not in your lineup, but I'm going to recommend that they are in your lineup this week. So we're going to start off with the busts, and I have a couple of these guys. The first one is somebody that we had talked a little bit about before, and that is Jonas Gray. He's going up against the Detroit Lions. He had one of the biggest games in the league last year or last week. Um, absolutely monster numbers, 200 yards rushing. Oh, well, I think it ended up at like 199, but for all intents and purposes, 200 yards rushing, four touchdowns, and Abraham Lincoln, four scores. At running back. So one of the biggest games that we've seen out of the fantasy football position um, this year at the running back position. And there's a lot of hype about this guy. There's a lot of people out there that are just looking at him as potentially being an RB1 from here on out. And I'll tell you what, I don't see it. I think that, uh, like I had mentioned, he came from the practice squad. There's not a lot of players in the NFL that come from the practice squad that make it onto an NFL roster and have a ton of skill. I'm not saying that they don't pan out and, and be quality players, but the hard work and determination thing is something that is it's different than physical skill. So if Jonas Gray had the physical skill, he would have probably been on the roster to begin with. But given the fact that he doesn't have the physical skill, he has to be out there busting his ass in practice, and he has to be out there really learning the playbook, figuring out what he needs to do to get to that next level. And when we see him miss practice this week, 
We see him late to practice, I should say. And then, you know, he his excuse was, my alarm didn't go off. Okay, like, we've all been there before, and I understand that. But you're an NFL player, man. Like, this is not your job where you go into some some office and you sit in a cubicle and it's like, you know, if, if you're late for work, okay, whatever. This is, you know, you got another cubicle job down the street if, if that one doesn't pan out for you. This isn't the NFL, man. Like, you're a guy who came from the practice squad. This is your opportunity. Not only should you be waking up on time to get there to the stadium on time, you should be waking up and and a couple hours early, you know, getting yourself fully ready, eating breakfast, you know, doing everything that it takes to get fully prepared mentally and physically for this game. And when you show up late to practice... It just doesn't really say great things about your determination. Now, I'm not trying to call out Jonas Green, say that he's not a guy that's going to try or anything like that, or, you know, he's a potential troublemaker. I'm not saying that at all. But given the fact that he is apparently, after his first opportunity to be the starting running back, he's already messing up. I mean, it could just be situational, or it could really be a sign of somebody that just doesn't have the right type of motivation. So I'm a little bit worried about Jonas Gray in that aspect, but especially this weekend here against the Lions, this is a tough, tough matchup, guys. The Lions rank sixth in the league in fantasy points per game conceded to opposing running backs, so they have been excellent against runners. They've only given up more than 80 yards rushing once this entire season. So that doesn't say great things for Jonas Gray. If he stays under 80 yards, he has to get into the end zone to be even a quality RB2. So, uh, to me, I don't really see this as being a very high-end potential game. The Lions have also only allowed four rushing touchdowns on the entire season. So, you look at this like, what are his realistic odds of scoring a touchdown this week? Maybe 50%, and the odds of him getting over 80 yards rushing, not that great. So, what's his realistic uh, output? I mean, does he get to 10 points? I I don't know. I I just, I really question it, especially given the fact that he's not going to catch a lot of passes out of the backfield. And we just don't necessarily even know that he's going to get all the carries here with Garrett Blunt coming back to the team and with Shane Vereen still being the team's flex, um, their change of pace wide or wide receiver like running back, I guess you could say, that catches a ton of passes. So, it's just not a great matchup. The Lions have been so good against the run this year, and even they've been even great against receiving yardage uh, to running backs. Or no, excuse me, I, I'm I apologize. I, I read my notes wrong on that. They've been terrible in a point uh, allowing receiving running backs to do well against them. So this is a week potentially for Shane Vereen to have a decent game, but I'm still not excited about Vereen either. And this whole running back situation in New England is just too tough to predict. I would stay away from it this week as much as I can. Obviously, Jonas Gray is going to be in a lot of people's lineups, but I have him ranked in the late teens at running back. I think there are a ton of guys out there who I would definitely start above him this week. I would start your, you know, your Denard Robinsons ahead of him. I would even consider playing almost like a Trey Mason above him, and I would certainly consider playing a couple of these guys here at my sleepers uh, above him as well. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But my my other bust this week is Matt Stafford. At New England, so it's the opposite side of this game here that we've been talking about. Now, Matt Stafford is somebody that I'll tell you this much: I came into this season expecting Matt Stafford to be a top five quarterback. I think that the physical skills of Matt Stafford are almost unmatched in the NFL. The guy has one of the best arms I've ever seen, but his decision making isn't great, and this is just not a good matchup. The Patriots just—they do such a great job against opposing wide receivers, and and. With Darrell Revis being on Calvin Johnson, I just don't see this as being a great matchup for the Detroit Lions offense, who already seem out of sync. The Patriots have also forced a ton of interceptions this year. They're averaging more than one pick per game, and Matt Stafford's been known to throw quite a few interceptions. So would it be surprising to me if Matt Stafford goes out there and throws for 220 yards and and a touchdown with two picks? No. And and I mean, is that a terrible game? No, but it's not a good game either. So I would definitely think that I would consider benching Matt Stafford this week, just given the fact that this is not a good matchup. He could go out there and put up decent numbers, but the high end potential to me just is not there. Their offense is just, it's not clicking how it should. And even with Calvin Johnson back, it it just, it's not working out right now for Detroit. So I would try and stay away from that offense a little bit right now until they start to get a little bit more in sync. All right, so let's move on to the sleepers. And again, these are the guys who are normally not in your lineup, but probably should be this week. 
Number one, Alfred Blue. We talked a little bit about him before. He is up against the Cincinnati Bengals at home this week. And Arian Foster is going to be out this week. So we are going to get our second chance to see Alfred Blue in as many weeks as the starting running back here in Houston. The Bengals have been awful against the run this year. They're, they've been very good against the pass, but they're definitely beatable on the ground. They've allowed an average of 113 rushing yards per game and over one rushing touchdown per game. So uh, unlike the, the Lions who are averaging 50 yards less than this in some games, or you know at least 30 yards less than this in a lot of games, and and they're averaging four touchdowns, uh, or maybe a touchdown per three games or so. The Bengals, on the other hand, have allowed a ton of rushing touchdowns, a ton of rushing yardage, and this is just tailor made for another great Alfred Blue game. Alfred Blue ran for 156 yards last week on 36 carries. So, I mean, there aren't very many guys that are going to get 30-plus carries in the league this year. But given the fact that the Texans hope to have Arian Foster back for the playoffs, they're really not worried about giving Alfred Blue 30-plus carries because he's their backup running back. He's not going to take 30 carries for the entire stretch of the season. You know, if he takes 30 this week and he took 30 last week, that's, a, I mean, it's certainly a heavy amount for a running back. Uh, but given the fact that he's only had a couple dozen carries prior to this week, um, or prior to last week, excuse me, his body is still very good. There, there isn't a lot of damage on it. And they're going to hope to have Arian Foster back next week. So I would not be surprised to see Alfred Blue out there getting 20, 25, potentially 30 carries again this, this week. And if he gets 30 carries... He's almost guaranteed to be a running back one against the Cincinnati Bengals. So I definitely like Alfred Blue. I would definitely try to get him into your lineup if you can this weekend. Another guy at running back who I like a lot, and again, I mentioned that both of these guys I like over Jonas Gray, so hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Isaiah Crowell of the Cleveland Browns at the Atlanta Falcons. Cleveland's backfield has been probably, other than maybe, well gosh, there's, there's quite a few this year. I was going to say they're the most unpredictable running back uh, situation in football, but there's there have been quite a few. But certainly they're up there in terms of the least predictable running back situations in all of the NFL this year. But the thing is, is that they did get a little bit less cloudy this week because the Browns cut Ben Tate. And it must be because they're confident in Isaiah Crowell and Terrence West. Otherwise, they just wouldn't make a move like that. I can't imagine it. But you look at a situation like Atlanta... And I love this matchup for Isaiah Crowell. Atlanta is allowing the second most fantasy points per game to opposing running backs this year. And they've actually been fairly good against opposing running backs over the past three games. They played Detroit, Tampa Bay, and Carolina, though. Some of the worst running back situations in, in the league this year. Um, a lot of mismatches uh, in, ter in terms of, you know, they're... they're should be running this style of football, but because they've got injuries, they're running this style of football. And that's what Atlanta has been able to feast on in the past couple of weeks. I don't think they've allowed much for points over the past three weeks, but you look at Isaiah Crowell and Terrence West in this matchup. These guys have been putting up nice numbers over the past couple of weeks. Cleveland's running backs are significantly better than what we've seen out of Detroit, Tampa Bay, and Carolina. And I think that Atlanta is going to fall right back into that horrible run defense that they, that they had at the beginning of the year. And I would certainly be surprised if Isaiah Crowell doesn't put up a quality day this week. Now, the one thing to consider is that we don't know who performed better in practice for the Cleveland Browns. Um, and that's kind of what they've been going off of over, over the past three, four weeks here. It's been whoever performs best in practice is getting the majority of the carries. And we've seen games with Terrence West. We've seen games with Isaiah Crowell get the more carries out of the group. And because we don't know what the situation is, I wouldn't be benching, you know, stud running backs for Isaiah Crowell, but I would certainly try and get him into your lineup because he looked great this past week, and I haven't heard anything about Crowell, you know, fumbling the ball or, you know, having any sort of issues in blocking or anything like that that would make him get benched in practice, so... I'm leaning a little bit toward Crowell being the guy this week, but also I think Terrence West, if you're in a deep league, I think you could consider looking at a Terrence West as a guy to potentially start this week if you know if you just are really desperate at the running back situation you just don't have anybody. It's possible that he goes out there and gets 10 to 15 carries, and if he does against this Atlanta defense, he could put up some nice numbers as well. So last guy that I want to talk about is Kobe Fleener. 
against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Kobe Fleener had a nice game this past week. Big, big time numbers. And he's actually been putting up big numbers for the past couple of weeks. In his past two games, 11 catches, 221 yards, and a touchdown. He has quickly become a reliable target again for Andrew Luck. These guys played together in college, so it's nice to see them start clicking. It's been a couple of years now where Kobe Fleener, we've been expecting him to break out, and he hasn't done it. But he has looked great over the past couple of weeks. He's looked like a tight end one. So, you know, it's hard to find guys like that at this deep in the season. There's so few tight ends that have been reliable this year. It's basically been Jimmy Graham, uh, Rob Gronkowski, and Julius Thomas. And even all of those guys have had down games. So you look at the tight end position outside of those guys, though. It has been super, super thin. There just isn't a hell of a lot of talent out there at the at the tight end position. So if you're looking at a guy like, you know, a, a Dwayne Allen um, was your tight end before this, who is going to miss this week's game, by the way, which also helps Kobe Fleener. Um, let's say you've got a Martellus Bennett or, you know, a Jason Witten or guys like that, a Vernon Davis even. All of those type of guys, I think I'm probably benching for Kobe Fleener this week at Jacksonville. Jaguars have been pretty mediocre against opposing tight ends this year as well. They've allowed the 22nd most points to, uh, or excuse me, they've they've they're 22nd in fantasy points per game allowed to opposing tight ends. So. You know, they, they really haven't been good. They really haven't been good on defense in general. Their whole team is really bad, obviously. We know that. But this is the kind of game, I think, where you really take a chance on Kobe Fleener, just given the fact that he's been so hot lately and he's been a big part of their offense. And it's really a, a potential where he could be a guy that you like going down the stretch. So if he's out there on your waiver wire, go and pick up Kobe Fleener. Start him this week over everybody pretty much but your average, uh, you know, your your usual starting glory tight ends, your Julius Thomas and Gronk and Graham. That group of guys are pretty much the only ones that I would start, um, uh, that I wouldn't start Kobe Fleener over at this point. So hopefully that helps you guys out. I hope you enjoyed today's show. That is going to wrap things up. If you did enjoy the show, please be sure to give the video a thumbs up below. And if you're new to the channel, please also hit the subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode. If you guys have any questions about your lineups this weekend, please be sure to leave those in the comment section below or tweet them to me at Clickwood TV. I will do my best to get a response to you before the games start. Thanks for listening again. I really do appreciate it. Check back early next week. We'll do a recap of week 12. Good luck this weekend, and I'll see you guys next time here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast.